Good afternoon and welcome to COVID-19 and the Disability Experience webinar brought to you by the New Practice Lab and the American Association of People with Disabilities, AAPD for short. We are so glad you can join us today. My name is Vontisha Flood and I'm the Operations Manager for the Public Interest Technology and New Practice Lab teams here at New America. I am a Black woman wearing a Black turtleneck and I have short red hair. In August of 2020, AAPD launched a research sprint to uncover barriers that exist for people with disabilities during the pandemic. Through interviews with stakeholders and individuals from the disability community, many of whom also work as community advocates, AAPD gathered lessons about how public programs intended to support people with disabilities must change to provide equitable recovery through this crisis and beyond. Instead of producing a report, we heard that stories of the COVID experience needed to be told from the perspective of people living with disabilities. We produced a series of stories from individuals who spoke about living independently, striving to thrive professionally and navigating this crisis. We published them on the AAPD publication page on Medium. You can find a link to that in the chat box shortly. We then heard each, we then tied each of the stories to an issue area and provided policy recommendations because we believe putting names and faces to these recommendations was powerful. This work was supported by Blue Meridian Partners. Everyone on the panel today played an extremely important role on this project. And I'm here today with Maria Town, who's the president and CEO of the American Association of People with Disabilities, Jose Hernandez, who's the New York City Advocacy Coordinator from United Spinal Association, Larry Wenger, who's the Executive Director of the Dale McIntosh Center, Christina Mills, who's the Executive Director of the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, and Nikki Ziegner, who's the Research Consultant here at New Practice Lab at New America. Our topic today is support for home and community-based services, HCBS for short. Each panelist will have about five minutes to respond to some questions and there will be time towards the end to elaborate further on any points made, along with the Q&A. Before we get into the discussion, I wanna share with you the five key issue areas that came out of our research. Number one, Federal laws and cash assistance programs were designed in ways that perpetuate poverty in the disability community, and this has created harm during the pandemic. Number two, digital solutions enabling civic life during the pandemic are not accessible for segments of the disability community. Number three, finding direct support professionals, DSPs for short, has always been hard, but the pandemic has made it harder. Issue number four, pandemic responses have not addressed the needs of, dis of the disability community. Also, the pandemic has made the disability community less visible, which has posed challenges to the disability rights advocacy. And last number five, the pandemic has increased the need for home and community-based services. With that said, I'll start with you, Maria. Of these five key areas, can you talk to us about why support for home and community-based services is important, the COVID relief bill, and how advocacy efforts have shifted due to the pandemic? Certainly, Von Tisha, and this is Maria Town from the American Association of People with Disabilities. I wanna pause really quickly um, to make sure that we're all set up around accessibility, um, I saw some notes in the chat that people couldn't see the interpreter. Can folks confirm that the interpreter is pinned? Okay, thank you. Um, so again, this is Maria Town. I'm a white woman with long brown hair, uh, wearing red lipstick and uh, a black dress. Um, Vantisha, thank you so much for that question. If you look at the history of disability in the United States. It is one of segregation and exclusion. It is one of disabled people often being hidden away either um, in our own homes or within institutions. Um, oftentimes 
it's uh, thought that institutions are somehow safer for disabled people than living in our homes and communities. And we, the disability community, have always known that that is not the case. Um, and the pandemic has uh, um, very tragically shown this to be true. Almost one half of all COVID deaths in the United States have, um, have occurred with people who, people with disabilities in congregate settings or folks who work in congregate settings. And yet, despite this overwhelming data showing the dangers of congregate settings, and by that I mean nursing homes, group homes, detention centers, jails and prisons and more, um, no COVID relief package that has passed has yet to include specific funding to help keep uh, disabled people in our homes and communities, places where we can help manage our own safety and protect ourselves from and our loved ones from the virus. Um, not only is funding for home and community-based services a disability rights and disability justice issue, it is also a gender justice and racial justice issue um, as funding for the direct support and home care workforce is also necessary to make sure that direct support workers, home care workers can make wages that are worthy of these jobs. Um, <clears throat> home, home and community-based service jobs are intimate jobs, jobs that cannot often be performed um, when you're six feet away. You know, th these are um, jobs where folks are lifting individuals, helping, helping uh, people eat, supporting people in employment. And um, this workforce is not thought of as a part of the healthcare workforce. So they haven't been prioritized for distribution of uh, personal protective equipment. Um, they have not been afforded hazard pay or overtime pay. Thankfully, the current COVID relief package that was passed by the House and that we are hoping is passed by the Senate does include dedicated funding for home and community-based services. It, it includes what's an FMAP bump um, specific to HCBS that would allow um, home care workers to, to, pay, uh, to be paid $15 an hour, to be paid hazard pay and overtime pay, and would also provide individuals who uh, receive HCBS um, more funding so that they can maintain consistent levels of support um, you know, it's, a, a, as I mentioned, it's not only um, disabled people who are often uh, vulnerable to COVID, um, because of the composition of this workforce, um, it, it has been, uh, the composition of this workforce shows that um, they are also vulnerable as well. And so it's this, these groups of people who are being hit incredibly hard with COVID who have yet to receive any, um, any relief whatsoever. Um, what we hope is not only will this current package that again is passed in the House and needs to be passed in the Senate um, happen, but in a future COVID recovery package that addresses more long-term um, solutions, we see a, a greater investment in supporting home and community-based services and ending what we think of as the institutional bias in the United States. Um, right now, it is much easier for individuals and families to get their insurance to cover admission into a nursing home or a congregate setting than it is to facilitate self-directed home and community-based services. Um, again, we call that the institutional bias and our policies need to be oriented in, in exactly the opposite way. What we need instead is an HCBS mandate. Um, so I'm hopeful um, given the where, where our leadership is going that we will see that in the future. Um, and it shouldn't have taken this long. It shouldn't have taken hundreds of thousands of people dying. Um, but again, as I mentioned, this was a population that was already um, put aside, already in the shadows. And so the advocacy on this, um, it, it, is, it has been a real, a real struggle. Um, and I want to really thank Larry, Jose, um, Christina and so many of the other people that we talked with about this project who were able to tell us stories of survival. Um, right now, the dominant narrative about COVID and people with disabilities and folks in institutions, it's not narratives, it's obituaries. Um, we need stories of disabled people trying so hard to live our lives so that we can um, determine the solutions on, on our own terms. And I, I'm grateful for New America and Blue Meridian Partners for giving us this opportunity today 
um, and in the stories that we'll share so that you all can get a sense of what those solutions um, are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. There are several factors that can lead someone into a congregate setting in the first place. And we developed a journey map to showcase these elements so that you all get a complete picture. Nikki, can you take us through this journey map a bit and tell us why your take on why human centered designer, people to centered design approach can help policy and decision makers move the needle on supporting home and community-based services? Yeah, and thanks, Fantisha. I'm a white woman wearing, can you all hear me okay? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, this is Maria. Um, when we put the slide up, the interpreter disappeared. Hmm. I'll wait. Sorry about that, you can um, take this slide down. So I'll just call out some factors and Nikki, you can go on with um, some of the elements of the journey map piece. Um, sure, so I'm, I'm a white woman with long brown hair um, and a dark top sitting in front of an open window. And um, so just a little bit of, about journey mapping is that it's a, it's a visual story. That's, that's really what it is underlying. And it helps us tell the story of a person as they go through a process to, an, to accomplish a goal. Um, and so in our research, we use journey mapping to uncover specific pain points in the process that um, people go through when they transition out of congregate settings and into independent living. Um, and we also did this to, to not only see where the pain points are, but then also to see where the opportunities are to address those pain points. Um, we also use journey mapping as a communication tool. So many people that we want to look at our work and hear our stories might not know much about the process of transitioning out of a congregate setting. Um, but we want them to, to stand in the shoes of those who are experiencing this. Um, so we want to make that process more concrete. Um, so, th so that's what journey mapping hopefully um, helps us do. And uh, Vantisha, just steer me a little bit. Do you want me to talk about the elements or? Sure. So we, part of the journey map, um, there's a divide between the elements. So the personal circumstances that would put someone into a congregate setting was COVID-19, quarantine, access to visitors, advocate support, families and friends support, self-motivation to make the transition and readiness for independent living. The infrastructures and resource policy side of the journey map that would affect someone either staying in or leaving is the caregiver availability, the length of stay, the need for funds to assist with transition costs like moving and furniture, things of that nature housing availability, access to internet and information, and policies that send consumers into nursing homes unnecessarily. So can you just uh, react to those elements? Sure, and I'm just checking in the chat. It seems like folks might be ready for that journey map slide again. So if it's possible to put it up, um, I think folks are interested. Yeah, um, great. So, um, so we, you know, we captured the process of how folks enter into congregate settings, um, and then, you know, what kind of helped to transition them towards independent living. And Vantisha, you went through some of the elements that are in that blue section, right? Um, it's a little bit small for me to read, but I, but I know this pretty well by now, so I, I know that's what you were talking about. Um, and so, you know, one thing that we heard and, and a lot of the folks who participated, we held a workshop to capture this information. Um, so it was really short, actually. We had a number of folks from the disability community who have firsthand experience with this process. Um, some of whom are on the panel right now, um, hat tip to both Larry and Christina. Um, and we, you know, we had them walk us through the journey that they, um, you know, that, that they've experienced either personally or, um, you know, helping somebody else go through that experience. And what we heard were that there are these factors that 
they're, they're like the little things, like if you were moving, for example, what helps you move from one state to another? Um, there are all these little details of like knowing the new place where you're going to be living, knowing where the resources are going to be, um, you know, and if it's, if it's in a moment like we're in now when you can't be in person with, with other folks, you might have to have access to the internet to see, you know, to find an apartment, to understand what the neighborhoods are like, to understand where you're going to get your resources. Um, so that's kind of like what these what these factors really were, they're, they're really not profound. Um, but that's kind of the point is that that it's actually really simple stuff that, um, you know, that's not impossible to do, but it's just absolutely kind of necessary to make that transition smooth. Thank you. You can, uh, thanks. So Larry, can you talk to us about the CARES Act funding and the ways in which it has helped those transitioning out of congregate setting? Absolutely, and thanks for the opportunity. And, and quickly, I wanna acknowledge the contributions of my employees, uh, my team to this uh, report as well. So, um, and, and thank you for talking with a couple of my uh, staff at, at Dale McIntosh. We are the uh, Independent Living Center serving Orange County, California, uh, just south of Los Angeles. Um, and um, so last March and April, um, you'll recall Congress passed the CARES Act and included in that bill, fortunately, was approximately 80 or $85 million for independent living centers across the country to respond to COVID-19 and the needs of people with disabilities in our community. Um, we are so appreciative that that was made available uh, to independent living centers as grassroots community-based organizations, um, a majority of whom our staff are, are people with disabilities. We are connected to the community. We're able to provide that support. And we know the needs because we're people who have lived uh, as people this, with disabilities and have this experience. Um, so I just wanna give you uh, an overview of, of some scenarios that we have encountered. And I am sure that these are not exclusive to our independent living center. I know that my colleagues at the uh, other 28 27 centers across the state of California and around the country have had similar experiences. We've had phone calls, uh, one for example, from an 85 year old woman who had spent every dime she had to pay for attendant services so that she could remain at home. And she called us literally at 5.30 PM the day before Thanksgiving, desperate for help. We've been able to provide personal assistance services. She remains independent living at home today um, and is working to become eligible and get on our states and home support services program. Another example, a woman called us, she's blind, uh, almost deaf, uh, in her late 60s, was discharged from the nursing home with no real discharge plan. Um, she had COVID and was recovering. Um, she does not remember the journey from the nursing home to her home, which it, by the way, is, was not accessible. Uh, she had no food no supports, and no help. There are countless other examples that I could talk to you about that we have been able to intervene and provide those supports for so that uh, folks could make that transition to living in the community. Countless more that um, centers, including ourselves, have been able to support people from ever having to enter the doors of a nursing facility, um, providing those personal assistance services and uh, a num number of other supports to help people remain independent. We've also been able to provide food, PPE, and other supports for people who, again, otherwise would be at greater risk, people who literally have not left their homes since the pandemic began last March. And that has meant the world to those folks and been a lifeline. I'm so appreciative of the flexibility that we were given with these funds to respond to the needs as they come to us to provide support to people who were otherwise at great risk of being institutionalized and losing their independence and possibly receiving a death sentence, quite literally. Uh, we continue to meet needs in our community. Um, I could talk about a number of other areas, um, but just suffice to say that COVID continues to be a, a, just an incredible challenge for our community 
I think the hardest part for us in terms of using these dollars to get folks out of facilities is we always talked about people in our community being locked away in these facilities and we're locked out. It used to be we could go in and talk to these folks and you know, kind of covertly hand out information and talk about, hey, this does not need to be the quality of your life. We can help you escape from here. We can help you get back into the community and live independently. We don't have that access anymore. And, and I understand why. The security and, and safety of folks living there and, and increasing the risk of bringing, bringing COVID in certainly warrants putting some protections in place. But that has been a barrier to us being able to help folks get out of these facilities. Um, so we've really tried to focus our efforts where we can on doing that, but more so on preventing folks from ever entering those facilities. Um, so those are some areas. I know um, uh, we, again, Centers for Independent Living continue to provide those supports and meet the needs of, of individuals in our community. Um, I think that the need is uh, more overwhelming and greater than what we have the means to support, but we're certainly doing our best. Um, we, we appreciate uh, the, the uh, ability to, to meet these needs in the community. Um, more is needed, more needs to be done to not just you know, be reactive and respond to the current crisis, but also to change the system entirely so that we remove the institutional bias that you know that it's easier for folks to get the supports from their insurance companies and, and other places to live independently and have those supports at home than it is to be forced to go live in a nursing facility. There's just no reason that needs to happen. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I appreciate that, Larry. For the audience, if you have any questions, please start dropping them in the chat and we'll start taking questions briefly. I'm gonna share a quote with you all. I'll just read it so we can avoid any other um, screen issues. Direct support professionals face huge challenges during the pandemic for their limited salaries. Many haven't had access to PPE or paid leave or childcare, making it hard for them to be careful and protect the people they're serving. This came from Bethany Lilly, who's the direct, director of income policy at the ARC. Jose, you're featured in one of the audio pieces in this project, and we learned that you're able to obtain care you need through the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program. Can you share with us your experience living through this pandemic, your ability to secure care that you need, and why this program is essential to you successfully living independently? Yes, absolutely. Um, the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program allows me the flexibility of hiring my own personal uh, attendant and training them to do a, a nurse level of care. So for instance, normally a person would require a nurse to come in to help change a catheter. Um, with the CDPAT program, personal assistance program, I can have my personal care attendant trained to change a catheter or address a wound or do something that a nurse would normally come in at $200 an hour, you know, to do. So now you're paying one home care person to do that, which saves money and keeps a person into the, in the community. So that's one critical issue, uh, uh, aspect of the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program. Um, what was the other question? Talk a little bit about your experience, um, you know, During navigating that. through the pandemic, some challenges so, and um, So the global pandemic definitely um, showed the pitfalls of the entire program and the entire system in general. So uh, in the late March, uh, late March, yeah, late March of last year, my personal care attendant that was with me for 12 years um, contracted COVID. And I saw him that Friday. And on Sunday, he calls me, he says, I'm not feeling well, but I'll come in Monday because he knows how challenging it is to get individuals to cover. And I couldn't take that risk. And I told him, no, you know something, I'll see you when you get back. 
Um, and two weeks after that phone call, he went on a ventilator and a week after that, um, he passed away. So from the moment he said that, you know, he's not feeling well, now I needed to scramble to um, find someone to help. So my night aid started working seven days a week and my weekend aid that was working nights needed to shift to days and cover, I think it was four shifts. And I needed to ask a friend to borrow one of their A's to cover two shifts. So, you know, as a community, we all helped each other to make sure that I can stay in the community and not go into a nursing home. So thankfully that happened. And um, now found, I found myself in a challenging position of finding someone to um, I can't. I can't say the word replace because no one would ever replace my um, my aid and essentially my family member, but someone to cover the shit that um, he used to have. Now I reached out to the company. The company wants you to fill out a forty-page um, application, which they can mail to you, and you can mail back. But there's that lag time. And in the middle of the pandemic, imagine, you know, the services were even slower. Um, luckily, I had a printer and I was able to print it, um, fill it out digitally and send it back to them digitally. But there needed to be or there needs to be a mechanism for emergency, um, emergency so that because we're on the CD PAP program, consumer directed program, we can take responsibility and say, I'm hiring this person while the paperwork is being done so that we don't end up in these settings. So that's one of the things. And I, I wanna to touch on something that Maria said and Nikki, where the services with, for people with disabilities are always the first ones to be cut. Um, especially when it comes to uh, home care services. So last year, right before the pandemic in New York, there was a convening of uh, Medicaid redesign team two to cut um, 2 billion on the Medicare budget and it came out of home care. They restructured the eligibility criteria. So now people who ha would have been eligible for um, home care will no longer be eligible to, for home care under this new criteria. So that would lead to more individuals leading into nursing homes. So it, it just like seems like we take two steps forward and three steps back as uh, individuals with disabilities. So, uh, and I could continue going. Um, in New York, the vaccination rolled out and there was a lot of ableism. There was a lot of caring about the economy and not individuals with pre-existing conditions like myself and people on this panel. You know, we have people coming in and out of our homes and um, we may be able to isolate, but we can't have those people isolating and they need to come into our homes to help us, to keep us in our homes. So it, there's a lot, it's a lot. So, and again, I, I could continue if you let me. We'll circle back in a moment. Thank you for that. And we're very sorry for your loss. Um, so we saw, we just saw Texas, Texas experience a major power and water crisis. Um, Christina, your organization developed the Disability Disaster Access and Resources Program. Can you share how other states can replicate and implement this in their communities? Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Christina Mills from the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. Uh, I'm wearing a black shirt and I have uh, long brown hair. Pleasure to be with you guys today and very honored to also have our member Larry Wenger here. Um, just quickly, the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, CFILC is, is not a center for independent living. We're the association that uh, works to represent and build the capacity of our centers for independent living in California that choose to be members on an annual basis. 
in 2020, we were uh, very fortunate to uh, launch a statewide program, and we believe it's uh, the first of its kind, Disability Disaster Access and Resources. And uh, while I had a vision in 2019 of, of what this program would look like, of course, uh, like everything else in the pandemic, it, it drastically changed from what um, I had put in a, a scope of work to a funder to what the reality was when the pandemic hit our state. Um, with that said, our, our program is really uh, focused on building individual and community resiliency and integration. And that has to do with all disasters and all emergencies. Uh, CFILC has been engaged in disaster work for over a decade and oftentimes partners with other national and state organizations, but uh, really creating this program um, has really made a difference for so many thousands of people in California, um, specifically who have been impacted by what we call power, public safety power shutoffs in our state, where the utility companies are uh, proactively turning off the power due to um, weather related issues that cause wildfires. So I know many people have been hearing about uh, wildfires in California for quite some time. Um, we have been providing over the last year portable batteries for folks to be able to keep their durable medical equipment and assistive technology going um, during the power outages, but also for those that a battery uh, does not provide the level of support needed, um, offering them a hotel stay in order for them to maintain their safety and of course decrease trips to the ER and unneeded hospitalization. Uh, but what we didn't intend was the impact that we would end up having in the COVID world. So um, one of the things that our, our office also does that is really important and has been elevated and polarized uh, during the pandemic is um, we have been providing for the last seven-ish years internet access for folks who are low income in California. And again, it's, it's, it's not across the country, uh, but I do think it's something that can be replicated. And while it's not perfect, it's definitely offered internet access to community members that otherwise wouldn't have been able to get online. And I think for all of us here, we, we have an understanding of how important and literally what the human divide has become as a result of having or not having internet access. And I never thought I would be talking about internet and disasters in the same presentation, but honestly, internet is everything in every conversation more than ever because of the pandemic. Um, so we have uh, three main focuses when it comes to internet access and the digital divide in, in our state. And we've been advocating for three main priorities that I think um, are just, again, being highlighted because of COVID. Nothing that just started as a result of COVID, but things that, that we've been pushing for that um, we're hopeful will begin to change as a result of maybe folks seeing the, the realities of what the internet can and, and leaves you out of when you don't have it. So one, um, the internet must become a part of the utility system. We very much believe that um, while we depend, the government comes in when we, um, the government is supposed to come in when citizens and community members need help. And they often do that during any type of other disaster. I think because this is an infrastructural disaster without having internet, we need to talk about it as it is a human disaster when people do not have internet access. Um, number two, affordability. We need to make sure that low-cost internet is possible. And for those around the country who are familiar with the Lifeline programs, one of the ways that we can really make the internet truly low-cost is making it an option through the Lifeline program that is national through the, I believe, the FCC. And then um, through our digital access pro project, we've uh, supported thousands of individuals in securing access to the internet from their own homes. And that's given them the option to 
look for jobs. Um, these are things per, before the pandemic, but we were always pushing it for uh, job search, for education, and for uh, socialization. But during COVID, we've also noticed that if you don't have internet, um, you lack the possibility of seeing your healthcare provider because a lot of healthcare providers are not allowing in-person visits. Um, in a lot of states, you must have the internet in order to register to get a vaccine appointment. Um, if you don't have internet it's and you don't have cable television, it's not likely that you even know what where vaccines are available. Um, even when you do have the television, you will hear it in general terms, but it's not to say that you're gonna hear about specific locations and how you might yourself individually qualify or go to get one. Those are the kinds of detailed and information that comes on the internet through searches. Um, and we've also seen that, you know, the need for increased socialization and telehealth access is at an all time high during COVID. And mental health across the board has been down because of the lack of um, socialization that people are having. And so imagine living in your home and not being able to attend even events like this. I mean, those of us in the workforce that uh, do have internet access, maybe because of our jobs, we have a privilege that so many people do not have access to. And CFILC, we partnered with the World Institute on Disability a few years ago. And at that time, between 35 to 40% of individuals with disabilities over the age of 18 did not have access to internet in their own home. We also believe that building and maintaining infrastructure for internet access is essential. Um, COVID has obviously amplified that um, in all ways too. Um, not even a state like California has internet in all geographic locations and the low income programs that we do have available through commercial plans um, are not offered across the state. So you may be in Los Angeles and qualify for one type of low cost internet, um, but you may not have a lot of choices. And if you lived in, let's say, a rural part of the state, you may have no choices at all. Um, or you do have a choice in a rural community, but the infrastructure isn't built out enough to allow additional subscribers to come onto the internet in that area. However, um, because of the CARES Act funding that Larry had alluded to and the amount of money that Centers for Independent Living um, received, in California, some of our independent living centers and our aging and disability resource centers have allowed and provided internet access through the funding that they receive. Um, some centers have purchased internet subscriptions for consumers. And what that means is they've actually paid for the bill in advance for up to one year. And that alone hasn't taken care of the issue because that's just one form of access that our community needs. Um, it's also about digital literacy and three, a device. So there's three factors when it comes to being able to uh, decrease social isolation and increase all of the great benefits and services of the internet, but you must have not only internet access and the capacity in your geographic area, you gotta know how to use it and you need to know, um, you need to have access to a device. So in that um, same vein, because we've been doing uh, affordable internet access programming in California for, for quite some time. Uh, we also have partnerships with uh, refurbished computer companies. And as a result of that, we were able to um, provide the independent living centers um, a number of hundreds of Chromebooks. I actually think it's in the thousands now for individuals that otherwise would not have been able to um, purchase their own or get access to a device if they did have the internet. So we have uh, provided Chromebooks and internet access to thousands of individuals during COVID. I think that that's uh, been one of the most popular and greatest benefits of um, service that Centers for Independent Living have been able to offer, especially for those of us who have underlying health conditions and are vulnerable to the pandemic. Um, 
of course, we are also incredibly fortunate to be the AT Act program in our state, which is very rare. Um, California is the only state that AT and independent living are um, housed together. And so as a result of that, assistive technology is another priority area for us that we're always looking to, to do more in. And again, that was sort of the reason why we were able to leverage one program to another in order to get consumers really what they needed during COVID. Um, and, I, and I think this is, you know, goes without saying, but not having internet in the world today is really similar. And I was trying to think of something that everybody like needs for the most part. It's like not having a pair of shoes. You can get by here and there, but if it's too cold or too hot, you're never gonna know what you could have, you could have had or learned because you couldn't get there. Same goes for those of us who use wheelchairs like myself, flat tire, you know, we can get by on a flat tire maybe in our house for a little while, but if we can't get out, we're very limited. So, you know, right now the need is online access for vaccine services, healthcare, employment, entrepreneurship, socialization. And one of the big things for us is because we do so much disaster work, there's going to be an up and coming reality of internet providing alerts for natural disasters and, and even non-natural disasters like the public safety power outages I was speaking of. Um, the internet is your key to what's happening in the world and what you need to be prepared for. So now is the time um, for broadband to become a utility and for access to be um, continuous in order to not leave marginalized communities out. And, you know, to Jose's point, like people with disabilities are constantly a part of the poverty cycle we will never get out of the cycle of poverty and depending on the government if we can't figure out ways to create an a robust home and community-based service system and long-term services and supports that allow us to to gain and invest in our futures without going into the constant cycle so um, thank you for your time. And um, obviously, this is a very much an intersectional issue as well. And uh, very happy to be a part of today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. That was such a robust, you know, amount of information. You get so much kudos in the chat. And thank you for being part of this project. We have 15 minutes left exactly. So we're right on time. And I'm going to go to some questions um, and please drop in the chat links to the respective organizations and the link to the AAPD publication page on Medium to further read about the stories that came out of this project. So I'm gonna start with this question from Ivy. It says, if the US Department of Justice requires Virginia to honor the US Supreme Court's Olmstead decision that states Virginia must provide community-based services, why are group home attendants paid more than attendants who assist individuals in their community at home? And this is such a great question. We definitely talked about um, direct support professionals at home need an increase in pay. Um, I will kick it over to Maria first and then We'll move to Jose. I think like anyone who's on this, this Maria, I think anyone who is on this call can um, answer this question very well. But the, the pay rate goes back to the institutional bias that um, Larry and I discussed earlier uh, in the webinar. Um, it, it is harder um, to, <clears throat> to get states and insurers to reimburse at um, higher rates for self-directed supports than it is to get, um, to get states to reimburse for care in congregate, congregate settings like group homes. Um, and providers are, again, incentivized to set up these congregate settings so that they can, um, again, get a, get a greater reimbursement rate. Um, when we talk about shifting the institutional bias, it's, it's not solely about changing like the language of our policies, but really the way that people are paid. Um, and 
uh, we, we need to make sure that uh, if we increase rates for uh, direct support professionals and attendant care workers, that we also have those same increases that, that the direct benefit that disabled people are receiving is also increased so that with increased wages, we do not see a decrease in, um, in hours that an individual can receive. Um, Jose or Larry or Christina, uh, do you wanna add more to this? I'd like to add some. Um, I think that you know it, the direct care personnel services need to be uplifted. You know, right now they are the bottom of the barrel. They're not considered, they weren't considered essential workers at the beginning of the pandemic. And they're usually immigrant uneducated people. So, you know, if the government doesn't think that people with disabilities are valued, they're not gonna value the people who take care of them. So I, I think that that's one of the underlying causes. We need to uplift the direct care services and make sure that they're paid at a rate that's above the minimum wage one so that we can um, get a greater pool of individuals. Because you could imagine that it would have been easier for me to find someone during the pandemic with everyone out of work. Not the case. You know, right now people would probably be uh, prefer to be on unemployment and get that extra $300 in stimulus than work for minimum wage taking care of someone in their home. And that's a shame. It's not good, you know. Right now, with New York covering up the nursing home deaths, uh, you know, people will end up in nursing homes and have a real possibility of dying. Larry, do you want to respond? Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to highlight. Um, my agreement with something Jose said, we literally just uh, last week had a situation where a gentleman contacted us and said, I can't find care in, in Orange County, California, where I'm at, the wage for an in-home in uh, care provider, personal assistance services provider is $14 an hour. Um, if you know anything about Southern California, it's, it's very expensive to, to live. Um, and so it's extremely hard for us to find individuals who are willing to work for that wage. We, we need society, we need people, we need Congress to value the contributions and important role of caregivers. Um, these are folks who support your parents, your grandparents, your brothers and sisters perhaps, um, who help sustain independence. Uh, and the need for caregivers, if you know anything about you know, that, that area of work in, and the needs of society, society is aging and the need for quality in-home supports is only going to increase and expand and we need to, we must value that work. And part of valuing that is paying a living wage. I just wanna add one thing, I'm sorry. Every day at seven o'clock, people in New York cheered for the essential workers. And my home care workers got up every day and risk their lives on public transportation to get to me. And they should have been valued just as much as those who went into the hospitals and into the nursing homes. This is Christine. I just briefly want to add that the California auditor just did a report and I had posted on social media, but in our state, we have some counties that are paying less than minimum wage for care workers. That's disgusting. I mean, this is people that we depend on that deserve just as much as the next person in terms of respect and, and pay and everything else. But I, I, last year, 2019, I was invited to Spain and uh, to speak about personal assistance services. And it was so embarrassing to learn that our system compared to Spain um, is so outdated and underfunded compared to what other countries are doing. And the fact that Spain had an entire post-secondary education degree set up to become a home care worker and that the starting rate for a home care worker straight out of college was at minimum $30,000 a year made me come home going, wow, something's got to change. Something needs to change here. And this is Maria. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I want to emphasize that the current COVID rescue package that was passed by the House uh, last week, I think, 
includes um, a bump in Medicaid directly for home and community-based services that would allow us to raise wages of care workers to $15 and above, pay them hazard pay and overtime. Um, however, this is only um, this bump is only for a year. It's temporary. We need permanent solutions. And I saw um, someone post a question about the the next uh, the Biden Care Plan, where he promised 450 billion dollars. Um, over the next 10 years to support HCBS and the care workforce. Um, and so we as a disability community, along with uh, the labor community, groups like SEIU and um, National Domestic Workers Alliance are organizing together to make sure um, to hold the president accountable to his promise and to ensure that um, this $450 billion is put towards greater community integration, home and community-based services and self-direction of disabled people, as well as lifting up um, this particular kind of work as absolutely and utterly essential. Thank you for that. I'm gonna try to pull one more question. We have about seven minutes left. Um, let's see. So this comes from Dr. Lavarada. Um, why is it that people who are able to arm assist at an independent living center refuse to arm assist a guest at their programs um, even before COVID? So Larry or Christine, are you familiar with these I'm, terms? I'm not. Uh... I, I'm not either, but I want to make sure I heard it correctly. Arm assist? Is that what you said? Yes. So maybe guiding somebody? Yeah, they're in the chat. Yeah, PCAs need more. Well, that's what she's saying. PCAs need more pay. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. And, and again, I'm not at a local center, but I can, I'm sure with social isolation, it's um, and social distancing, I mean, that's, that's likely maybe a problem when uh, folks need help with guiding, with arm guiding. Um, I could see how that might be a, a wellness and social distancing issue. Um, Larry, do you want to say anything else? Yeah, that? you know, I now that you're, I'm, I'm kind of connecting arm assist, yeah. you also mean arm sighted, assist. sighted guide, perhaps for lo low vision people. Uh, and if I'm wrong, I am apologize, but that is definitely an issue. Um, that, um, you know, folks, I just want to broaden this just a little bit, that folks with sensory disabilities, be it deaf or visual disabilities, and certainly others, I'm not trying to make any one disability more important or more affected than the other, but it's very isolating um, to be in a situation where um, you don't have uh, some of the senses to be able to necessarily recognize that you're too close to somebody or you know so if you go to the grocery store now you need to stand on you know squares or, or follow arrows and things like that around the store and it's you know it, it just my personal experience is some with low vision I mean it has been so isolating I have barely been out um, over the past year because of the fact that um, it's just so isolating and you it's very hard to navigate or uh, listen and communicate in a world that is right now so visually focused on watching out for other people, knowing that that person you're talking to is wearing a mask, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that that's probably part of it that um, if in fact, that's what you're kind of trying to ask about it, it's just so hard right now to access the supports that you need in some cases because of the safety concerns. <clears throat> yeah, that's, sorry about the miscommunication. So final point, we have about four or five minutes left. Um, something that came out of our research that was very, um, should be obvious, but it was just very blaring is that in order for people with disabilities to live in the community successfully, they have to have a support system. They have to have people in place who are willing to um provide them with their needs, with, albeit family members, friends, neighbors. Um, final thoughts on the desperate need for a solid 
support system at home. Jose, I'll start with you. Um, I guess it starts with uh, organizations, you know, holding support groups so that we can um, create those friendships with networks. Like um, I found with the friends that I have that have the same services that I was able to reach out to and say, hey, I need help. So we met at support groups or, and, you know, we stayed friends. So yeah, definitely, you know, family. I don't have much family to speak of, you know, I live in New York alone, but I do lean on my friends and they are a critical um, part of my support system. I would also, I, I want to add to this and just say though that everyone needs a support system. The supports that folks with disabilities need may be different and unique to disability, but during this time, you know, everyone needs a support system. Um, as persons with disabilities, you know, our goal is to be independent and as, as self-sufficient as possible. Um, what we're advocating for here in the conversation today are changes to systems that will, will help with specific issues connected to disability to sustain independence to, to not end up in nursing facilities. But, but I, I do think it's important to stress that, you know, really everyone is in need of a support system during this time. And, and this is Maria, just to reemphasize both Larry and Jose's points, everyone needs a support system in order to survive in this world. Um, but I think what Von Tisha is reflecting on and what, what emerged so strongly from our research is how many systems and forces and structures make it so incredibly difficult for people with disabilities to sustain community connection and to sustain our supports whether that's with friends or family members or um, a larger community. Um, so many of our systems and institutions, um, again, try very hard to segregate us uh, because of um, the stigma attached to disability. Many, many folks, uh, many disabled people don't have the benefit of CRIP wisdom or CRIP community, and that can be life-saving, right? And um, that is so much of, of what we do at APD, at SILS, at United Spinal, is not only make sure that disabled people have connections to the broader community and, and their families and friends, but that, are, that disabled people are connected to one another. Um, you know, we have had to be so resilient. And I think um, one of the things that all of us on this webinar are working towards is building a world where resiliency is not required um, but that where we can just connect, exist, and thrive um, as we so choose. Thank you so much, Maria. That was beautiful final words. Thank you all for joining today. Please be on the lookout for the stories coming out of AAPD and follow up with all of our panelists in their respective organizations. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye.